Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 424, Operation Sledgehammer. During the series on Operation Pedestal, we got a glimpse of the pressure Churchill and FDR were under in appeasing Stalin, that they were fully committed to defeating the Axis, just as Axis forces were tearing into Soviet territory. The fear the Western leaders had, and rightly so, took form in the idea that Stalin may reach out to Hitler to suggest a separate peace. This would allow Russia to sit out the rest of the war and rebuild, maybe even using the war to take additional territory, like it had in Finland and the Baltic states. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were invaded and occupied in June 1940 by Soviet Russia, but only after signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that made it possible. Clearly, Stalin would not hesitate to take care of his own, even making a deal with the world's current devil. As anything was possible, and it would be bad for the Western allies, Stalin needed to be shown that, without a doubt, the West was in this to the end, and they would do all they could to draw more Axis troops away from the Eastern Front. Pedestal had been one such grand gesture, and at its conclusion, another gesture was about to get underway. Clearly, the British would be leading the way on this as the Americans were newly entered into the war. But whatever London chose to do to show Stalin and the United States that it was game to take on Hitler's Germany, it had to be chosen with care. At this point in the war, the Allies had few wins in their column, while the Axis were still on the probable eve of victory in several areas, and that would only increase if Japan was added to the equation. So what to do? That wasn't too risky, but still daring. This was going to be a challenge in that London, who had been taking the brunt of the access since France was forced out of the war, suddenly found itself with two partners who were much larger in terms of population and industry. Should the British somehow learn to be deferential? That might be going too far. But if they wanted to win this conflict and keep their empire intact, well, tack was needed to placate the U.S. and USSR. And given Britain's defiance, Operation Pedestal had been a perfect example of this, of not giving up, rumors were rife in occupied France that the Allies were coming ashore at any moment. And in the days just after Pedestal finished, tales were being told and then embarrassingly ignored, as they were not true, that the British had just landed in saint valery a port 20 miles or 32 kilometers west of Dieppe, and the Americans had landed 8,000 men somewhere. But then something real happened, or really happened. On August 17th, a Monday, American bombers attacked Rouen, the regional capital, about 40 miles or 64 kilometers south of Dieppe. Their target had been the railway junction, but some of their bombs had gone astray which was normal in bombing operations. But it still unnerved the Germans and the French. For the latter wanted the Allies to come and liberate them, and the Germans were equally convinced of a coming attack. As one German soldier put it, We are here. They must come. They have no other choice. Another idea pushing the inevitable attack was Churchill's meeting with Stalin, which had recently ended. Surely the Man of Steel would demand that the West do something to draw Axis troops out of Russia, and that something was an attack on mainland Europe. But how and where would it come? That was the million-dollar question. It's not as if the British could look at this two-and-a-half-year war and say, well, some things we've lost and some things we've won, so we can do this. No, the British had lost every major engagement against the Axis. After all, they had been pushed out of Norway, Belgium, France, Greece, Hong Kong, Malaya, and Singapore. And it looked as if Egypt and perhaps the entire Middle East may soon be added to that column. So the British public, understandably, were pessimistic. But that was matched by the chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Sir Alan Brooke, who had been in charge since late 1941 and he had written in his diary at the time that he felt a growing conviction 
that we are going to lose. So perhaps London needed to take the fight to the mainland, not just for Stalin, but for their own sake. A conservative newspaper in London had recently written, Virtue somehow, for some reason, has gone out of us. The national fiber is unmistakably different from what it was in those days of 1940, which the Prime Minister could speak of in accents that carried universal conviction as our finest hour. No one can pretend we are living through our finest hour today. Indeed, half of the country was disappointed in Churchill, which caused his depression, his black dog, to reappear. And though it was a world war, all politics are local, always. Those against Churchill saw an opportunity in early 1942 to rid themselves of this man. But Churchill had other enemies besides Hitler, Mussolini, and Dojo. He also had Ambassador Sir Stafford Cripps. Yes, Churchill had been the man to embody Britain's defiance, but that was back in 1940. Here now, in early 1942, Cripps, who was the British ambassador to Russia and who had helped create the alliance with Moscow, was starting to be seen as an alternative to Churchill, and Cripps didn't mind the talk so much. He was the opposite of the current Prime Minister. He was thin, simple, and direct with his words. He didn't drink, and he didn't smoke. And it was felt by some in the country that as the war had changed from survival only to seeking a victory, perhaps it was time for a new leader. And the more he spoke on the radio, comparing Russia's sacrificial mentality, the correct one to win a war, versus Churchill's string of something other than victories, and his obvious desire to maintain the status quo, Cripps had a more progressive outlook, and more people took notice of this man and talked of a possible change for the better. But then a voice much louder and dominating took over the airwaves. That was the voice of Stalin. Privately, he had been asking the Western leaders for a second front, but then he went public with his request. And in his public request, not only did he say that Russia was doing most of the fighting, that even in the recently ended winter, the fighting had continued, but just much slower, now they were in the spring, and their Germans would be back with their allies. The Russians needed their allies to open a second front, for it would be a shame if Russia was forced to make a separate peace with the hated Nazis. Still, needs must. And this second front now chant was taken up by the newspapers, by the Americans, by the Canadians, who all seemed to forget that there would be much that went into a massive offensive. Chants didn't produce landing craft or remove the enemy from the beach, but that chant is what London heard over and over. And it was that spring of 1942 that Stalin had a message delivered to Churchill through his ambassador, Ivan Maisky. In part, the Russian ambassador told Churchill and Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden at Chequers, Germany is preparing an enormous offensive this spring. She is staking everything on this year. If we succeed in defeating the German offensive this spring, then in essence, we will have won the war. It would only remain for us to finish off the crazed beast. Now, suppose we fail. Suppose the Red Army is forced to retreat again, that we begin to lose territory once more, that the Germans break through to the Caucasus. What then? For Hitler will not stop at the Caucasus. He will go further to Iran, Turkey, Egypt, India. He will link hands with the Japanese somewhere in the Indian Ocean and stretch out his arms towards Africa. Germany's problems with oil, raw materials, and food will be resolved. The British Empire will collapse. What will be our chances of victory, and when? That is the choice before us. It's now or never. This wasn't bluffing or an exaggeration, and Churchill and his generals knew this all too well. But the questions remained. Where were these supposed resources supposed to come from? Where should they strike? Clearly, a place that the Germans valued or feared losing to get them to commit troops, because if that didn't happen, 
then this entire enterprise would be a waste. Geography dictated that their target area be in France or the Low Countries, as it was roughly 21 miles or 33 kilometers away from Britain. But again, the lack of resources was the issue. Great Britain would need months to gather up men and equipment and months more to train those men. So what to do? In theory, Pearl Harbor had taken care of that. The United States, with its population and industry, could provide enough for both countries. But very quickly, Churchill and his military men found out that General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, had his own ideas. Further, Marshall had recently created the Operation Plans Division for how to conduct the war, and the man in charge of that was Major General Dwight D. Eisenhower. But there was a downside. There always is. Marshall was gung-ho for a cross-channel invasion. Get a lot of American troops over to Britain, put them on ships, land them in France, and fight all the way to Berlin. But the British knew this was not possible. Certainly not in 1942. Still, London could not openly say that to Marshall. No, better to make promises, seem to go along, and then slowly let them down while altering the course of the Allies in response to Europe, to something that might actually end in something other than a complete defeat. On March 5th in London, there was another meeting going over all this again. Russia and Washington were demanding action. The British did not have the means at this time, but Stalin may make his own separate peace. Something had to be done, which just happened to be Churchill's specialty. So the next day, he jumped into action by sending out a memo that wanted to know what could be done if it became imperative to carry out a holding operation in France, say July 1942, with the object of keeping Russia in the war. That same day, the Chiefs of Staff Committee met. Within it were the heads of the Army, Navy, and Air Force that made the big decisions for the conduct of the war, which included the CNC Home Forces, General Sir Bernard Paget. They were to speak about a large-scale operation, probably on the coast of France, that was to take place in May or June. Because Stalin had been complaining for months, there was already an idea of landing at least six divisions in France to help the Russians, and it would be General Paget who would be supplying the troops. And RAF Fighter Command Sholto Douglas was there as well, as his would be providing the air cover for this operation. But there were issues from the get-go. Paget and Douglas wanted the landings to take place at Pas de Calais, but others wanted it further west, say, in Normandy. There, the defenses and the defenders were less strong. Now, no one was using the words suicide or sacrifice, but many in this room were thinking that this would be Allied troops committing suicide or sacrificing themselves for the Russians. Whatever it was, whatever it turned out to be, and for the moment it was being called Operation Sledgehammer, and though the Allies did have a few divisions untrained lying around, Sledgehammer would grow in scope as time went on. But when the Chiefs met again a few days later, March 10th, they had to acknowledge their lack of trained troops, and only trained troops would have any chance against the motivated and experienced Germans. Perhaps something smaller may do the trick. After all, the only thing that mattered was whether the Allies did or did not draw Axis troops out of Russia. So the idea now was to have a smaller raid, but one close to British fighter bases in southeast England. That way, the landing might not end up being overwhelming, but when the Germans showed up, the air might of the RAF could push them away, hopefully causing more troops to be called in, again from Russia. This quickly became something that only possibly might force German airplanes to leave Russia to help against the Allies. And the best place for this was, it was determined by London, somewhere near Calais. But nothing could be settled. Meeting after meeting went by, and the same questions arose. 
Was this a raid, or was it captured territory to be held? Should it be at Calais, where the air cover was possible, though the Germans were stronger, or in Normandy, where the Germans were weaker, but there would be less air cover? Round and round, and who knew where it would stop? And because nothing could be settled on, soon there was another plan brought up called Imperator. Here, men and tanks would land at Boulogne, and they would drive on to Paris, destroy the enemy's military headquarters, and then fall back and evacuate, but from a different port, you know, to confuse the enemy. That this was even discussed is amazing. Plans should be simple, as they always change based on the enemy's reactions. So to have something set in stone and hope the enemy plays their part correctly that's military madness. Still, it was considered. But then playtime was over, as the chiefs were told that General Marshall himself would be coming over to work out a specific plan and a timetable. The Brits did not want to be seen arguing in front of the one man in uniform that President Roosevelt listened to. And Marshall was bringing his own plans those created by Eisenhower's new department. Both Americans wanted action ASAP while the Russians were still in the war, and if all went well, they would stay in the war. The British were nervous about a Russian pullout. The Americans were panicked. And tucked under General Marshall's arm were acceptable options drawn up by Eisenhower. Just before Marshall left for London, Ike gave him, on March 25th, a plan for a full-scale invasion of mainland Europe. It called for 30 American and 18 British divisions to be landed somewhere in northern France on April 1, 1943, a year into the future. The 7,000 landing craft, still unbuilt, would land somewhere between Boulogne and Le Havre. Now, back to reality, American troops were just starting to cross the Atlantic in early spring 1942. The landing craft were low on the U.S. Navy's building list, and yet Marshall approved Ike's Operation Roundup, as it was called. It was bold, it was daring, it was war-ending, it was American through and through, and it was incredibly naive. That is, if it was to be accepted at face value. But General Marshall did not get to where he was by always saying what he thought. No Operation Roundup, at least the April 1943 version, was to serve as a jolt to the British, who, by American standards, were taking it easy. Which is further proof that the Yanks still had a lot to learn about this specific war, say, rather than the Great War, decades earlier. Eisenhower had also created a much smaller plan, something like Sledgehammer, that was to be launched by five Anglo-American divisions, and done quickly if it looked like Russia was about to collapse, or somehow Germany was suddenly made weaker. However, that was to happen in 1942 is still a mystery. General Marshall was expected to arrive on April 8th, but with him would be President Roosevelt's alter ego, Harry Hopkins. Who knew what Marshall thought about the British or if they could get anything past him, but London, specifically Churchill, knew Hopkins and admired him greatly, calling him Lord Root of the Matter, as Hopkins had impressed the Prime Minister. They actually met on Churchill's first day on the job, but now Hopkins would be involved in the talks with a keener eye this time. Again, FDR listened to Marshall, who wanted a cross-channel invasion, ASAP, as he wanted this war over, and FDR would want the unvarnished truth from Hopkins about the British. But Churchill had his own ace, the head of Combined Operations HQ, Lord Louis Mountbatten. Well, supposedly an ace, as he was only 41 years old and had recently taken over, as of October 1941. But whether it was Mountbatten's youth or drive or, more honestly, his ambition, he did bring a boost of energy and freshness to the position. In fact, the COHQ had just completed an attack, specifically a commando raid on the point of St. Nazaire along France's west coast. 
and with that gone, the Axis had just lost a dry dock and repair berth for Hitler's last battleship. In truth, that raid would make little difference in the larger war, but every little bit helped, and it was a morale boost to a country that sorely needed it. Even better, if you just happen to be Lord Mountbatten, Churchill also made him the fourth permanent member of the Chiefs of Staff Committee. And just like that, Dickey, as he was called by his friends, went from being a Commodore to acting Vice Admiral. And in a move that was typical Churchill, as combined operations would work with all three military services, Dickey was also made an honorary lieutenant general in the Army and an air marshal in the RAF. Mountbatten would also be working with Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Porter, Chief of the Air Staff, age 48, as well as about to be new chair of the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, or SIGS, Sir Alan Brooke. And considering his position, Mountbatten would need to stay in Brooke's good graces to keep his new job, almost regardless of what Churchill thought. But acting Vice Admiral Dickey now had a new task before him. He had to appease the Americans and make a solid plan that, when executed, would impress Marshall, Brooke, and hopefully not get a lot of good men killed. Dickey had always wanted the spotlight. Well, now he was in it. But that spotlight could quickly turn into crosshairs if this still-forming operation went badly. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as you probably noticed, we're doing a little detour. Um, I wasn't going to do Dieppe yet, but because it's hard upon the end of Pedestal, it just makes sense to show what... Uh, Churchill and FDR were doing to try to appease Stalin, and then we will, of course, go back to Stalin, the Eastern Front, and all the action there. So just real quickly, I hope that's okay with everybody, but I think I can wrap this up pretty quick. I don't think it'll be like a pedestal-length episode. We'll see how it goes. But uh, I've always been fascinated with Mountbatten. Um, There's so much good and bad there. Uh, I've always been fascinated by him. But anyway, we'll see how it turns out. So as far as my newest members, I wanted to say welcome aboard. There's Ronald Pones from Verona Beach, Florida, and John O'Day. I think I'm saying that right, John. hope I am. As far as donations, there's Daryl Wheaton, Steve Birnbaum, and Michael Phoebus. So thank you very much to all those people who are supporting the show and getting me through a rather challenging uh, time here at the house. So Again, thank you very much. We will see you soon with the next episode. And if you are so inclined, uh, if you want to write me to the email address at wwiipodcast at gmail.com and tell me your honest opinion of um, the episodes coming out uh, more frequently. So again, I'm just uh, something new I'm trying. I just want to gauge your reaction to it. So if you wish to write me, that would be great. Um, Yeah, so enjoy your summer, and as always, take care, everyone. Okay, honey, we need 58 burgers and 31 hot dogs. I thought we were having a nice little 4th of July family cookout. I saved so much at BJ's Wholesale Club that I was able to invite a few extra people. Plus, I saved 50 cents a gallon at BJ's Gas. Save 50 cents a gallon at BJ's Gas when you first spend $150 in one qualifying transaction through July 4th. Important terms and restrictions apply. Visit BJ's.com slash great fourth fill up. Not a member? Join today. Who's that guy on the diving board? Get it, bro! He got my buns wet. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings.